I also am very grateful to be here. It's been sort of touch and go. The, t- the surgeon's touch, I go. Um, anyway, um, thank you. Uh, Everybody has made this possible. Werner and Kate and um, all the team. And those from Switzerland who helped, of course. And I don't want to forget Robert Catamus, this beautiful design he did. In fact, I'm really, as you know, a person of ideas, and other people helped me materialize them. The design came out of an idea I had. And you know, energy is neutral, and it's depends what you do with it, isn't it? And most of the books that are the best sellers in Germany and England make me so angry. That, that gave me a lot of energy. It's to turn into something creative. Actually, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, is a good book for beginners. It didn't test anybody, and it's fine. It also didn't tell anybody what they might do about now. And then there's a new book which, um, by Tolle, which is very nice, very compassionate, called The, Go- the New Earth, and uh, it has even one and a quarter pages on the word breath. That made me even more angry, so <laughs> so I'm very grateful to Mr. Tolly. And then when I was really running out of energy, I read a book which... <laughs> I'm not criticizing the books. You know, you hear, I'm not criticizing or judging. They're very good. But then just because something infuriates me doesn't mean to say it's bad, does it? That you should apply. You realize this should apply to you, too, doesn't it? Everyone here are meant to be students, so you know that I, how I speak. If I was to say this in a public lecture, they think I was attacking Mr. Tolly or anybody else. I'm not. I'm compl- complimenting them on very good books, which infuriated me. I might not even have picked them up. I even bought them. Because why? I wanted to be up to date to come here. And I always spend many weeks before seeing you in preparation for various things and one is to be like a living journalist reporter but a a journalist who without criticizing sees things as they are so that we can all share at least in that to start with (coughs) and remembering that these so-called spiritual books are a reflection of a part of society. And the one that really has made me so cross that I'm full of energy, you may remember a man called, who wrote a book called Conversations with God. Do you remember that? Oh. Um, and um, an American gentleman. He's since read many other books. Well, recently one of our group wrote me a letter resigning from Chalet. And I think he thought I would be upset. In fact, I was thrilled. (laughs) (laughs) He's been 20 years more around and never learned anything. Anyway, he wrote me a two-page sermon as from saying how he was never satisfied with me as a teacher. I thought, is a teacher meant to be satisfying you? (laughs) I sort of things like husbands and wives. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he wrote me a sermon um, based on the newest book, latest book, by the man who wrote Conversations with God. Now he felt completely satisfied. And, and this was absolutely what he, he thought. Yes. So, Rashad Paddington Bear has to go and buy the book. And I don't read spiritual books. I don't read books anyway. So. This really got me angry. Yes, this made yeah. me so happy with anger. <laughs> I read it twice. <laughs> I think it's in German. It's called What God Wants. I strongly advise it. If you're short of energy, read What God Wants. In this book, he said, God wants nothing. It's one of those Advaita things. We are all enlightened, you know. But not only God doesn't want anything, but then you're God, I'm God, we're God, and we therefore don't want anything, etc. So, by that time you see this is pantheism, 
But I'm going to finish the book. Because I know there's a hook. Because you need a hook for a fish. You have to wait all the way until the last two short chapters. He gives you his address. <laughs> and thanks to these good books, I, is one of the reasons I'm here, I think. I want to tell just a few stories to begin with. Uh, tell you the purpose of these two days. Living alone, has, completely alone, uh, has its good advantages and, and disadvantages. Uh, I see very few people, maybe once in a week or two weeks, if that. And, um, <coughs> and those people are very nice, but there's nobody that, except for one uh, or two, two people who are with us, um, who I can actually talk to, as we can share. And today I want today, today to be uh, a very direct morning. I want to be very clear with you about many things. And then tomorrow I'd like to be more of a dialogue between us. And I explain why I can't talk to the people in Totnes. You may have heard me say, and what, an early, uh, when I was very young in the work, I was always told about the inner meaning of manners. And certainly whenever I'm with the people in the cir circle, you can feel the manners. You can feel the cleanliness in the room. And nearly all of you who have been around long enough to know the importance of all the levels of cleanliness I am referring to. The only people I know in the area where I live uh, in, who are involved with so-called spiritual things or, um, have absolutely no teaching or training except their own opinions and the agreement of others. I'm not being rude about them. It is not their fault. They have never had the benefit of a, a teacher or a school, so they don't know. And that means they are basically deaf yeah. and blind. And that's what it talks about in the Bible and the Quran, what that means. And remember, everything I'm talking to you about and everything I'm giving, I want you to listen inside for you individually. What does it mean to you? Not what it means to anybody else. Just what it means to you. But the people who are deaf and blind, it means that they can't hear beyond the what has is being said in this world of appearance. It's already too late. Because by the time you said it, it's something else anyway. <laughs> what they, we need, all of us, is to reach a point where the, one of the most important things of all is the word meaning. What does this mean to me? In fact, in Brillant, my beloved teacher, in his, uh, one of his books, um, it was said, how he was explaining to us he reached a certain stage that all he could see was meaning. And this is where these people who have unfortunately never had any training don't understand. They can't see. They're blind because psychically, that psychically the whole room, the rooms in which they have their meetings are just filled with the thought form of the day before. How can you see through a cloud of, of chaos, chaos and opinion. It, again, no blame. It is not their fault. And we are very, very lucky that I had a, a very good teacher and the very important schools before I met Bulent. So we have more possibility of hearing. Sema literally means listening. So we are coming together to listen. That includes me. I don't want to talk at you. I want to talk with you. And I have been listening in this last very painful time when I'm out of bed deeply to what is happening in the world and what is best to help you with. Now, do you want the good news or the bad news first? I'm going to give it to you anyway. So okay. <laughs> I'll give you both sort of interchange. Recently, I received, last week in fact, an email from Alabama. 
He'd, a man who I had met many, many years ago, beautiful heart, yep. but a little crazy. But just because he's a little crazy, you don't receive him. In our circle, whatever it is called, that door is open and anybody who wants to walk in can walk in. And he wrote to me and he said, do you feel that the reason um, that your school is still going active is because you accentuate the meaning of breath? And he remembered an old quotation of mine in the States that as well as breath you say, which I do, that this school, whatever you call it, has no label. There is nothing to join. We're not dependent upon um, form of any sort. And that is why I've often called it the mystical and metaphysical science of the individual. Today's metaphysics are tomorrow's physics. What I was teaching 30, 35 years ago, everybody said I was nuts. Well, I am. But a lot of it is now physics. And a lot of things I say to you now will be tomorrow's physics. And why is this? If anybody asks you, uh, you know, what you're involved with, you can always remember the worlds are not big enough to contain me, but the heart of my faithful servant can contain me. In one year, in one year, if you are awake, you will see the world has deteriorated considerably. In the 20 years since I've worked with you, this is the good news, bad news, or bad news, good news, the world is far worse than when we started being spiritual. Many of you are much more unhappy than you were then. Do I hear some agreements? Yes. Certainly, are you any better? <laughs> huh? <laughs> what is the point of meeting if the world goes on getting worse have you or I or any of it done any good at all since the pyramid is built from the top down be honest with yourselves now the, just to give some humour to it sort of humour um, Todd Nares is the sort of psychic centre of England more rubbish is talked in Totnes than anywhere else, including the government. In the States, the worst is Sedona in Arizona, closely followed by Santa Fe in both places I have lived, by chance. For some reason, I seem to be a garbage disposal machine. At least I do my best. But unfortunately, sometimes the garbage disposal machine um, <coughs> gets in trouble. <laughs> And certainly in Totnes, if I open my mouth, I'm in trouble. And I want to explain why I'm saying this. Again, without comparison, but as a journalistic statement, at the public lecture, I'm going to be very, very direct, because it's public. But here, of course, I talk very much more intimately to you. You will read in my books, and even in the first book, that there are to be two confrontations. This, of course, is within ourselves and expressed outside ourselves. It's in the last barrier, in the, in the, in the what not, there is. <laughs> that is the conversation between those that know and those that do not want to know, and those that know and those that will have to know. You have been with me long enough not to ask me some stupid questions as what that means. Isn't that true? One of the jobs, the tasks I have, is to what's called awaken your intelligence. That doesn't mean intellectualism. It means to awaken the latent intelligence within each one of us so that you get the answer in your own way. If the intelligence is not awakened, it is not surprising if nobody can hear or see. When you leave this room, do look in the front desk. I've put out a funny English humour card. I don't have time to get it made into a poster, but I'm going to ask it to be done for the public lecture. And it's a picture of Jesus, you know, typical long hair and robes, huh? knocking on the door. And the comment at the bottom is, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one, that's English humour for you. 
Anyway, to come back to Totnes as an example, or in this case Germany, or wherever we find this word spirituality, or spiritual books, or the work, or Gurdjieff, or uh, anything, right? There is a very direct division, which you may not have noticed. No blame. But it is my responsibility to point it out without criticizing. It is inevitable. And that is the division between what is now called the Advaita movement, which includes the the man conversations with God. It includes the magazine What is Enlightenment. To a certain extent, it includes that very good magazine in Germany called Advaita. I think it's called Advaita, isn't it? I wrote an article in it. Yes. Yes, it's privately financed. Anything that says, basically, we are all enlightened, all we need to do is to know that. And this is now the majority, wherever you look, whether it is Santa Fe, wherever it is, is this big, big movement. And within that movement, there are also certain patterns. This is important you understand what I mean by pattern. It doesn't mean anything more than a pattern. But, for example, in the Nuremberg war rallies, before the war in Germany, they were very advanced, Germans always have been in these things, and they put patterns in the lamps, which they flashed onto the 100,000 people. And the pattern contained a concept which subliminally would affect the, uh, the thinking part of the mind, the mind of those there. I want you to understand this. Mm-hmm. It is done all the time on television with advertising, but it's actually illegal. Now, please understand that I want freedom for you. You want freedom from your, for yourselves and for others. All the things that fit into truth... We can say that's fine, but if you try and define truth, it is not truth. Now, we're not part of the Advaita movement, but if anybody comes to us, or any of you want to leave and go to that, that's fine, nothing against it. But the two will not mix. They will not mix. One of the patterns, for example, I'm going to mention here, without criticism, is the Enneagram. Sure, if you want to play with the Enneagram, good. But it is my experience over the last 30 years that the people who have got stuck with the pattern of the Enneagram, which is typing people and themselves, right, are stuck. You cannot communicate with them because half of their mind is wondering which type somebody is. However, I am not very particularly educated in in the many things. But I knew there was something wrong with it, whether Gurdjieff said it or not. Gurdjieff said he invented it at one time, then the Jesuits said they invented it. I'm sure it is very useful, I just don't work with patterns very much. However, I was asking and asking, and it is your duty to keep asking. Because the truth is always unfolding, in truth for the sake of truth. If something, don't believe anything, don't believe me, I will say that. Don't follow, don't be followers. Don't join things in which you make promises you may not be able to keep. Those days are gone, although they exist for some people. And so I went on questioning and questioning, what, why does this Enneagram thing bother me? Well, since last year, I've been very much in contact with a woman in India. Uh, I won't go into the story again, but uh, she wrote to me. She is the only person since my first book was published, that has ever asked a question or commented on it, what the meaning is. And that's true. Not one of you have ever asked me, not one of you, in Europe or the States, what does it mean? That is why the book, after 30 years in the German-speaking language, it is still alive. Because it does contain meaning. If you want to say it's to do with Sufis or dervishes or something, it is. It's anything that you want to make it. But it goes on living because, because it has meaning. And it is your job to extract the meaning. 
So this lady, Patricia Nureli Bashevi, she is incredibly wise and comes from a different school uh, to us, or me, totally. She comes, she's originally Italian, and she's worked in the United Nations and all these things. Oh, she God. is, must be good because she's been thrown out of many places, physically even, and attacked. <coughs> from the Sri Aurobindo ashram, she was thrown out in various places. That's good news. Well, Somebody gets like thrown out of a school, that's pretty good news. Mm-hmm. Anyway, in the course of our long correspondence, um, her language is so different to mine, and I don't understand all of it, hers. I brought up something that she said in one of her nine books, and that was on the Enneagram. And she and made me jump up and down like a small puppy. In her own language, she said exactly the same as I said. Anybody who gets stuck in the Enneagram is stuck. Okay. But she explained why. So finally, after years and years of searching, 30 years myself, maybe 40, when the time was right, are we listening? I understood. The Enneagram misses the feminine completely. And that we can discuss tomorrow if you wish, but it is interesting to note. So this patterns I'm just mentioning, as part of the present division, the division which is absolutely obvious and I would say almost necessary at this time, but they... It's not the right time for them to come together again yet. We will also notice that in the last year or two, just two years, religion has taken on a very strange mood. (laughs) I don't need to repeat, except for the sake of the video, the stupidity and the horrors of the war, the complete misunderstanding of 90% of people in the West and certainly in my own country, about what is the meaning of the word Islam. Uh, I do need to say, however, that now less and less people want to know the meaning. Because, being both blind and deaf, they are looking at the world of appearances, which are not, is not good, is it? Mm-hmm. So now we have a civil, basically a civil war in Iraq, and heaven knows what else will come soon. On the Christian side, we have just as much trouble. In England, the evangelists have really come. In two years, they've hit England. Visualize a picture of England, like a map, and you just so you can see it. So, I mean, Scotland's up there, right? Cornwall's down there. Well, right in the middle, the whole of Middle England is now Muslim, basically. And generally speaking, everybody gets on very well, but it's just basically, there are more mosques going up than uh, ever, most of everyone. And the churches, on the other hand, are empty, but in the last two years they're being taken over by the evangelists okay. in my country. Right. Hallelujah, baby, let's rattle. And they're so severe, these people, it's called Alpha, it's in Germany too. There are now two million, this was on television the night before, last, three days ago, Two million signed up to Alpha in England of the last remaining Christians, and there's not many left. I'm trying to point out to you what is happening under your noses, which you don't probably, we don't notice. Remember. In my country, there have been more murders and, uh, to do with children and murders than ever before in the last. It's just increasing at the same time. In Religion the- and murder goes together. So this is the so-called bad news. And the other side about... And the obvious stupidity of your God and my God, and so we fight and all this stuff. It's pathetic. Have we got any better? And so, two more little stories from my country. About uh, two months ago, I was invited to go and see an old lady of 94. And she was, is one of the most famous potters in, uh, of England. And had just received a knighting from the Queen. A beautiful little lady. And she'd asked to see me. She hadn't actually read my books, but she'd heard a lot about me. So I sent her a book in advance. Alchemy of the Heart. I thought, that's nice. And um, I went to visit her. She lives in a tiny hut. Two little rooms. One in which she sleeps and one in which she lives. First time I went with an old friend who's about 80-something as well. And it turned out that um, I couldn't exactly work out why she wanted to see me. 
But then it, very soon it came, what was the thing? We hadn't had just the first bit of cup of tea. And then she started talking about the Enneagram. And I said, oh, poor lady, okay, now what do we do? It turned out she'd been in the Gurdjieff Foundation, the Uspensky Foundation. She spent one year residential with J.G. Bennett. But she disapproved the idea of a teacher. That's one part of the thing. So, therefore, she didn't find one, obviously. We had a good tea, and then we left. And then I asked to go and see her again, alone. But just as you can imagine, this little old lady and myself, she had very bad arthritic hands, but she said, I have no pain. And she told me how she had to move from the hut she's lived in for 30, 40 years. The, she didn't complain. She was, uh, the hut was going to be taken down. And then uh, I was reading, listening. What was she trying to say? The law of reciprocity. I'm learning as you're learning, I hope. So if you listen, and one of the names of God are Same. And I realized what she wanted to say something. So I had to create the space for her to speak into. This is, by the way, active compassion, providing the space. Love in action, I call compassion. So echoes will come from good space. Finally, she said, she had read my book. And she said, honestly, I don't like it. I said, well, I don't mind. That's fine. I just didn't know which one to give you. And then she sort of crumpled, like, like sort of, um, you know, that crumpled like paper. You know, she she sank. And it was the only time she'd ever been honest with me. How often are you honest with each other? Come on, be honest with yourselves. Most of you never say what you feel. What we do is we say something that might please the other person or draw attention to the illusion of ourselves. And then she said to me, rush out in a very quiet little voice, and she said, "Um, you know, I've been in these schools and she was 94, since I was 21 or 22 years old. And she was obviously, you know, she won't live, she might live until she's 100, but not so long. Yes. And she said, you know, I have no answer. And I was about to say, thank God, because there is no answer. But then she said, but you see, also, I haven't got any question." And I was about to say, thank God, again, because in the Advaita thing, of course, it doesn't matter anyway, you know. But actually, she'd given up completely. And unless some sort of miracle comes, she's very intelligent. On this, maybe I helped her and activated something. I don't know. That is the state she is in, which is nothing, one or the other. She never invited me back. That was the good thing. Because I must have annoyed her and provided thus a piece of energy. But we were honest with each other. I tell this story about honesty. I do my best with my books and what I say to you and what I write and in the letters I write to be absolutely honest without pretense. And I want you to have that incredible courage you have to be to be honest, whatever happens, because that is the way whatever the message I'm giving you will be passed on to our children and our children's children. I'm not just talking to the physical children. If we can't be honest with each other, how on earth are we going to have any good effect on the world? Where you go to, whether it's Tottenham, Santa Fe, I don't know about Germany, different places, and you hear more rubbish spoken in spiritual terms than you hear politics, and that's incredible. Because people are not honest, they're too frightened to be honest, And as you know, I'm often getting into considerable trouble. (laughs) One week ago, I was in considerable trouble. Why is it that I upset people so much, I wonder? Well, I've told you why, because I'm honest, but, you know. Well, in order to keep up to date for you, etc., I went to a one-day seminar. For me to go to a seminar in Totnes would be rather like getting a crocodile to climb a mountain. <laughs> anyway, the, the hall was full, about the same number as this. And it's one of those networking circuits. I don't know what you call it in German. 
They're all over England. They sort of um, people network. That means they ring people up and say how important they are. You know, and have terribly important little meditation groups, which are called core groups. And uh, we don't talk about the husbands. They do, and it's all right. Anyway, I went, and this is called the Scientific and Medical Network. Yeah. And last October, I was asked to be the speaker, but I was too ill, I couldn't do it. And it is run by a man who's older than me, who had the same teacher, not personal teacher, but teacher, as I did when I was 21. I'm just talking about the linking, it's fascinating. He was the personal secretary and traveling companion of the man who terrified me who was a, uh, a doctor in London called Dr. Rolls, who was head of the uh, Spensky uh, circuit. Right? Wow. And Dr. Rolls had been the personal travelling companion and secretary of P.D. Spensky. Anyway, he's head of this, he's a doctor, so he was head of this thing. So I went very politely, very humbly, all by myself with a cushion, because the seats are terrible, I know from before <laughs> And there were many people, retired physicists, chemists, scientists, doctors, and a bunch of mystics. Tottenham's mystics. You can always tell because they look so ill. So, <laughs> sitting next to me was a man I wouldn't even dare talk about who I'd already had a row with. And <laughs> There was an introduction, and then this man whose doctor something was to give the talk. And it was on consciousness and manifestation. So I made discreet inquiries. He wasn't a medical doctor. He was a doctor of computers. But he wanted to be a mystic. And for one hour, he tried to mix the two. Oh, yalla. He had a screen. And a friendly man who could get everything organized, I accept, you know. And onto the screen, he put uh, his eight lines eight lines of his poetry that side and eight lines that side and a picture in the middle and he read his poetry very nicely yeah. for an hour Thank with occasional little comments the mystics couldn't understand the scientists obviously the whole room was moral they and then finish questions and answers so a very nice lady who was in charge stood in front she works for Médecins Sans Frontières. She's a very nice lady. A very strong lady. In this. Oh. And she stood up and said, who wants to answer questions? Her fingers went up. <laughs> including mine. <laughs> well, in, as you can imagine, since nobody pays attention, but we nearly always have people, we used to have them at Johannes a lot, whenever anything came up like that, I said, look around and see who it was. We always, nearly always get those sorts because they want to see what other people are thinking because they're not doing anything. And so, you know, it's like when people say, now everybody close their eyes and everybody puts one eye open. You know, to see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so everybody's looking and there's hands up. And so she's noting the hands. And she caught my eye, which means my finger had got caught in the damn, that's good. And she announced in a very British way there would be eight questions. A mutual friend of, of ours starts I off without uh, any question. He gives a long discourse on the subject of poetry. Which I was, saw. And anyway, nothing was done. And then various people, physicists, disagreed with him. Mm. Nobody actually mm. asked a question. Oh. They used him to express themselves. Mm. Now wait, I want to explain something about sorbet or question and answers. And then, in a the minute, I'm going to give you the subject of these two days. I haven't yet. Okay. I'm warming you up. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> nobody really asked a question, and, um, yeah. and, and so on. My turn came, so, bless her, to the formidable lady. And I said, excuse me, doctor, thank you very much. I was very polite, very quiet for me. <laughs> you have used the word consciousness very much. And I would like to know what you mean by it. Because I haven't the slightest idea what it means. I, I said, it is one of the words that is used considerably. I'm one of the minority from the mystic part here, but it seems that the mystic side and the scientists both use the word consciousness. 
And I said, in the last cycle, the defin- there was a definition of consciousness. I said, which I rather like. And I was saying this to help him say something. Sylvie, he started off the colour of your jersey, pink. He then went into the colour of yours. He was getting redder and redder. And I said, they used to say that consciousness, consciousness is the reaction of active intelligence to pattern. Now, presumably you have got active intelligence. Uh, and that, that was a, Alice Bailey saying it's in one of my books and we used to discuss it. Now I said I have read and I've heard this word consciousness even used in politi- British politicians. I've heard it so many times. And so I'm asking you, but nowadays people are also saying what we call the Advaita people, bunch, right, the gang, right, that when you're enlightened, all you're left with is consciousness. All the room was honey. There were some were nice bees, and a lot were wasps. One had a higher sound, the wasps and the bees and bees. I was the only person who was being honest, that's why. So I said, as far as I'm concerned, when you're enlightened, what you're left is with absolutely nothing, which is the only true freedom. Please, sir, what does consciousness mean? Whereupon he went, he was absolutely apoplectic. <laughs> and he was so like this, he couldn't answer. And so there was a tremendous pause in the room, which I was which was a creative pause. Mm-hmm. And then he said, like this, awareness of being, which means nothing at all. Which is, that means absolutely, just an expression. And left. However, the interesting, the reason I'm telling the story is in the light of the story before. Quite a number of people even older than me and some younger, the most, you know, 60 years, 60 years older people there, mm-hmm. came to me and with so much gratefulness you wouldn't believe it. And one man who was about 90 came up that and he said, you you're the only person who said anything honest in the whole afternoon. Okay. Isn't your name Rashad Field? And I said, yes, because mm-hmm. nobody knows me in England now. Mm-hmm. He said, I thought so. I came to some of your talks in the mid- middle of the 60s. Then a woman came up to me, full of aggression, oh, younger too? than me, and came up, putting her nose quite close to mine, she was so angry. <laughs> yeah. And she said, do you meditate? Well, there are several things that infuriate me. One is if anybody asks the date of my birthday, because then they'll say what astrological type I am. It's not their business. Oh, very bad manners. That's one thing, and... Do you meditate? It also annoys me. So I said, I am. So she's looking up at me with her little nose, and I'm looking down at her with my big nose. She said, do you meditate, I asked. I said, I am. Mm -hmm. I said, how can you separate meditation from from what what I'm doing? I know where my feet are, I know where you are, I am where I am. Now, she was apoplectic. (laughs) So she said, if you meditated, you go inside and then you get the answer. Yeah. Well, as you know, Rashad's got a naughty side. Thank so you. I said, well, what, can you tell me, what is the meaning of uh, consciousness? Thank and you. she ran down the stairs. She was gone. Um. Now, this is funny stories, but they're sad stories. There is so much of talk which doesn't do any good because people are not straight and honest with each other. Yeah. They don't know the language and so on. Having said all that, I will tell you what the title of these two days are. And I want you to really listen to what it means, because it's for your good, for the good of all. The title is Free the Teacher. I've only told two or three people who went into shock. I said, ah. In fact, there's an enormous meaning to this. And we're going to concentrate on it for the whole of this time together. You can be quite certain it's nothing to do with the fact that I've not been well at all. Nor that I'm about to die. I might be, I don't know. Um, my sister is dying at this moment. And she's got the same bug I got in hospital. 
It's called the killer bug, actually. More people died of this thing that I got in the States than AIDS last year. Anyway, that's not the reason I mean free the teacher. I'll go back to last year, summer school. My plan, plans, as we all say, of, uh, <laughs> nearly always go wrong, you know, they can do. There would be a summer school this year, which I wouldn't go to, but would be a theme around which you would concentrate, which would be something to do with this. Well, for some reason there couldn't be a summer school, so that is why I've pushed this forward to now. That is the reason why I'm doing it now. In the last 20 years, some of you have been with me all that length of time, even more. Some are relatively new. We started off with, we were flying. (laughs) We had the enthusiasm, the baraka, all this thing. We did the most outrageous things. We even built a tent out off the side of the mountain when they said it was not legal. But luckily the, one of the students was the Burgermeister, a Burgermeister, so that helped. We've invited the most extraordinary sheikhs <coughs> and people. I brought in the term. Rumi starts humming. And my friend Coleman Barks, he's a very close friend of mine, he's actually... Um, he sells more books than the Bible in the States now has been. So he's the best, the most biggest seller now, but it's dying out. I want to tell you, it is dying out. That cycle is going. And during these last few years, the Rumi as the pole of love has turned into, for some people, the Lord, which is a gross misunderstanding. It turned into, in some lots, almost religion. Almost. In the States, there are so many websites you couldn't count. All this has happened in our time. And when I say free the teacher, it has so many levels when you can get to it. It has even got to the point now, if you look up Medlevi on the web, you will see Sheikh Nazim, who many of you have heard of in Germany, I'm sure, very famous Nakshabandi Sheikh. He now advertises himself on the web. You can see it. Max Bundy, Medlevi. He has now a group of people teaching the term led by a, another sheikh who is neither Medlevi nor Max Bundy, I don't think. South East Asia, but based in Holland. There is Medlevi centers opening up all over the place in England, and ever is whirling about. Why is this? I've always said we are not Medlevi. You can be if you want to be. In which you get case, you go to Peter Kuntz and learn all the traditional stuff. On the web the other day, I even saw advertised a piece of wood. I don't know the name in Turkish, but it's a little piece of wood that traditionally, Mevlevi, they stick on the side of the door so you kiss it. It's going Um, back 700 plus years. 75 pounds they were asking for it. So in other words, this confusion about what it all is, is in our midst. Next year, it has been officially announced by UNESCO that 2007 is the International Year of Rumi. And I hear very secret reports from some very secret angels. And I have uh, heard that Bush is learning the term. (laughs) And that Blair is learning the term. Also the other one who's coming after Blair, but they both turn different ways. They'll have a special meeting at the United Nations next year where they'll have some imported dervishes from Turkey whirling about in the middle of the United Nations. Really. I am not being critical. This is potentially what is going to happen. Thus you need to know, each one of you individually, what you stand for. Not, I am just a pupil of Reshad. 
And you're not a member of Charis because you, you didn't join in it. Are you a Sufi? I have a man from a German magazine coming to see me next week with the question. And I would say, no, of course I'm not a Sufi. Not but if you want him. to uh, believe it, I said you can believe it. We, those of you who've been, and thank you, persevered during all this time, the people in this country, in Europe, in the States, and so on, need to come up a whole level of <laughs> consciousness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you actively and terroristly rise above the pattern <laughs> of what you see in the world, which is just as much chaos in the spiritual path as it is in the political. And as I have said so many times, the dignity of man, man and woman, cannot be upheld enough. It is below your dignity, each one of you, to need a label. It is below your dignity, otherwise you would not have persevered with me this long. I do not give you answers, I leave you with questions. That is a question of what I've just said. It is below your dignity. Ask yourselves. Recently somebody wrote to me and said in his letter that he had become Mevlevi. I like him very much. He's a good friend. And um, I wrote back a very nice love letter <laughs> saying to him, why did he use a label after all this? He's not a student of mine. And he said, is it not true that most people are not looking for anything but a suitcase of their own to put a label on? But when you find your suitcase and open it up, you'll find in it there's nothing but rubbish. I mean, look at that picture of your inside. I mean, <laughs> um, when you find the suitcase, which is begin steps of knowing yourself, then you won't need the suitcase or the label, will you? So what, now we're going to talk about freeing the teacher. We're even going to tell you, the royal we, how you can do it. However, and, and unfortunately, nothing happens in one day, obviously. But I need to explain these steps of fana, because I don't want to use the word fana anymore. I don't want to use Sufi language anymore of any sort. Sufi except between Kaffee. friends. Or Muslim, Muslim friends. But this present cycle, we are going to work for the, the next generation. In my country, don't you dare use the word Sufi. You might be shot. Because either they're thinking of 9-11 and they mix it all up with fanatics. And, and so we need to know the meaning of the words without having to use them. The cycle has changed. Okay, we can use it together, yes, but don't walk out in the road and say something involved with Fanafi Sheikh, Fanafi Rizim, Fanafi Allah, and what have you. Find your own language. Your German, your German, your German, your German. Learn to understand as individuals. This is what I came to you for at the beginning, but it's taken a long time. So what are the steps in our tradition, as it used to be stated? When I first started and I was known as a sheikh, I was known as a sheikh in public. Nobody worried. They just thought I was nuts. Would you think I'd say I was a sheikh now? Thank I've been officially me. excommunicated anyway, which is good news. As a Mevlevi Sheikh, that's the best thing ever. Yeah. So the first step is Fanafi Sheikh. What does it mean? It's a very simple thing. When we're humble enough to know we don't know, something is awakened in us. And if there is a coincidence of what I call lines of time or lines of force, and if our desire to know the truth is really intense, we want it more than anything else. Well, then, then we, that is a very small number of people in the world, we will attract a teacher to ourselves. 
It doesn't mean to say everybody needs a teacher. There are some who do not. And there are some who should not. <laughs> and who are teachers anyway. You know, this is something for you to find out by now. So, in this Fanafishek, Fana means annihilation in roughly. Knowing we don't know, we follow in the footsteps of the Sheikh, learning what we can from him. 90% of what we learn is probably useless because we are not cooked enough. I think we all know, if we're honest, that we cooking is necessary. <laughs> By the way, do you know why vegetarians can't eat M&Ms? Do you have M&Ms here? In the radio the other day, they're called Smarties in England. You can have the black ones, the blue ones, the yellow ones, but you can't eat the red ones. Do you know why? Because the red ones, the color is made from squashed beetles. <laughs> Cochineal is an edible dye. It reminds me a bit of religion. You can eat this and not that, you know. And I had a lovely picture of the sort of Easter Catholics, you know, and having a bowl of M&Ms and blessing the red ones, saying, it's okay, you can have them. <laughs> okay. Then, after a while, there's a certain length of time normally in these things, you go on to what's called Fanafi Razul. Now, we know that the Prophet, peace and blessings, is the seal in the line of the Prophets. Thus, the study of the Fushra Silikam and the particularly the works of Ibn Arabi is very useful because it can unfold what is already within you. Why? When I first met Sheikh Siddham and Delhi in Konya, little humble uh, Sheikh of the Middle East, sometimes it was difficult, the translator wasn't so good. He, he used to really shock me and he used to wave his little finger, his little short man at me. And he would say, you have to be the Jesus of your time, the Moses of your time. And then sometimes the Noah of your time, and the blah, 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 right through the line of the prophet. And you must be the prophet, the, the Muhammad meaning the completion, etc. And you must be the Nathan of your time. And at that moment, that time, I wasn't comprehending it. It shocked me because I didn't want to hear any labels or words. I'd even forgotten I wrote that story of the rosebush, which contains the secret anyway. <coughs> and undoubtedly I shall say that in the public lecture. So when we can accept and know the seal of the prophet, then we are on Tasawuf, the path of return. When we know, with Fanafi Sheikh, Fanafi Razul, Right, that the completion is in the Prophet Muhammad, then we are on the path of return. Now, Fanafi Allah is the next step. Although I may appear to be very fierce sometimes and very direct, I do my best to be very careful Just and not let you jump over steps too far because you might get hurt. So for 20 years, I have and more, I have been talking to you about the prophets and Arabi and Rumi and then, then, then. I could possibly have gone straight to Fanafi Allah, in which case your zikr at night would have been 5,000 Allahs for the first 40 days. And something would have happened. But I'm not saying that you would not also have had to maybe go back and bring things up again. The meaning of freeing the teacher is illustrated in the paper that I wrote um, for Advaita magazine in Germany. I'm sure you all have it in your journals. If not, you should have. Um, but I'm going to tomorrow be reading this. And the object of it, I'm even going to tell you the object and how to do it. Um. Freeing the teacher is not letting go, right? Uh, or uh, throwing the teacher out of the window, into the, which reminds me of a lovely story about um, one of our students you know very well. Didn't Remember, okay. function is very important, and you know I love telling jokes. Well, flow is so important, isn't it, everybody? Flow, flow. 
Well, do you remember Sousa from England? She can't come. She's been not well. But the, one of the things she's just done, which is a perfect example about letting go or throwing away, or it's a story of goodwill is not enough. Or perhaps for a while, that moment, she'll be listening to this tape, I'm sure, uh, active intelligence was not present. Her husband um, was not at all well, and he had come out in great sores, rashes. So she heard that if you give some, if they have sores, you get it, fill the bath and you put masses of, um, what's this stuff porridge is made of? Oats. Oats. Well, something like that. Anyway. However, one has to be intelligent about these things. So she put him in the bath the and Martin poured in all the stuff. Him? Well, his rash got better, but then, uh, then the whole of the plumbing system in the house packed up. <laughs> So, in other words, letting go or throwing out is not what I mean by freeing. <laughs> and I'm talking to initiates here, in the, mostly. It's and hard. remembering that this initiation is only during my lifetime, as instructed by my teacher. Okay, After I die, my, it will yeah. not go on. It cannot be done by any one of you for another. Uh, the reasons, if you ever ask me, I can tell you, but um, yeah. another time. Anyway, um, I'm talking to you as, therefore, close friends. You have to somehow or other, as I have, have become completely unattached to anything. It doesn't mean to say discarding things or whatever. I, it's nothing to do with form. It's to do with something much deeper. Until one is completely non-attached, there is no real freedom, right. as the Buddha would say. And we also need to remember, and this is particularly for two or three German people in the room, yeah, who did suggest uh, that perhaps one day we had a summer school in Konya, which I didn't agree with, Thank because I think Thompson. pilgrimage is very, very much a personal thing. Yeah. And going to Konya today, as Marcus knows, is not the same as when I went in 1969. Yeah. Identification or attachment with anything and is, is a limitation. And when I say, when you're going to, f to free the teacher, you will immediately think me, Rashad. Yes? Well, this is nonsense, isn't it? Because there's only one teacher. This is my functional job, which I represent. Supposing I tell you a story, which happens to me frequently in this context. I quite often get letters, which is very nice, saying thank you. And I always remember Rumi's words, gratefulness is the key to will, the one will, divine will. And gratefulness, the sound of gratefulness is something I'm always asking you to re remember. It's always here. How can it not be here since the grateful one, the, one of the names of God is the grateful one? So how can it not be inside? So if we, um, I include myself, when all the time one's complaining because of pain or this or that, and forgetting to be grateful, you're in denial, aren't you? Well, recently I had a very long letter from somebody, uh, from a man, and um, he thanked me very much for the time when I was his teacher and how much he had learned during those years. What what did that letter mean? It means he's never found a teacher. Can you please let absorb this? Which means he had never reached the point of being a pupil. And which is a very pupil. high station and is interchangeable with a teacher. I am a pupil. I, I make efforts as a pupil to prepare myself to see you. It doesn't mean to say we can all be teachers. For heaven's sake, don't try and be one. It's not easy. It's a very rare bird. Birds are all becoming extinct. And spiritual pollution from books, I think. Anyway, so I couldn't say anything to the letter except thank him for thanking me. But the fact is, you can't, as it were, have a pupil with a teacher one day and not the next. So people often say to me, Rashad, is Boulin still your teacher? 
to which it's such a stupid question, I just say yes. Well, the answer is true. But I'm not talking about an ascended master. A true teacher is already one with the divine. He's not sort of halfway up a ladder and saying, you know, waving. But when I accepted the fact, and I was accepted, which was the biggest thing, I was accepted as a pupil and and um, Burnett became my teacher. Right? Then there was a period for 14 years when I didn't see him and I... The only way I came to understand what I'm teaching you now was the total state of rejection, I remember. Dejection, not rejection. Mm-hmm. Because I had not reached the station of understanding that I hope you all have, and if not by the end of the weekend you will. I had not reached that point. The fact I didn't speak to him for 14 years didn't matter. I had forgotten that I made my agreement with him outside of time. And that is why initiation does not work for everybody necessarily, because they forget. But a promise of that level is made outside of time, as we know it. By freeing the teacher, you're freeing the light of the teacher in your souls. It is another level of breaking down any form of separation. And thus any need for labels. Or even sometimes feeling sad when your best friend has disappeared into another suitcase. Because at this time of history there are waves. And you are unique within the wave. You're not meant to be drowned with it. People say, I'm not feeling well, it must be to do with a bomb in Iraq or something, you know. Yes, we know that everything is interconnected. Somehow, we have to be the unique within the unity. And the unity is distilled into the uniqueness of each individual. And in that way, we can reach a state of total conviction. When you're in a state of absolute conviction in the unity... That does not mean to say we walk around and say we're enlightened, you're enlightened. It doesn't mean to say we stop working on ourselves. Because that is gross stupidity. Because it is true that every conscious breath you say, Rumi says it, Huffy says it, Jesus said it, even the physicist said it the other day, every conscious breath you take is having its effect on the whole. If we reach a point of conviction, we then don't just give up and... uh, And uh, I'd just like to read a story, two little things, and then we'll finish for today. I'm very, actually, very grateful that I could keep going, because the mornings are mostly my worst time, so. And thank God for not working with alternatives. In darkness, everything is an alternative. Every form of remedy is offered to me, this and this, you know, and each one is worse than the other. The only good thing about going to alternative practitioners, as I see it, is that you get information about unnecessary things. <laughs> I even found in Totnes the other day, uh, from the acupuncturist, shh, secret. Have you heard of Awaska? Most people have. It's a South American drug that everybody's onto. It's the big thing. We know a person... We know. <laughs> she is so popular now, she's eight groups of 12 to Brazil. She doesn't even have Indians present, and they take this and they get bombed for a week. Yep. Anyway, this acupuncturist told me, this is just for humor before lunch. It's good for the appetite. <laughs> yeah. You get it in I said, No. I said, well, I should think so, but I didn't ever. So he told me of an address which was in the industrial area, you know, un- Unit C. So your friendly shake, friend, idiot, your puts on his best clothes and goes to find Unit C. He didn't know there were two Unit Cs. <laughs> so I knock on the door and it says outside, do not enter without knocking. Then, do not enter after no- <laughs> knocking <laughs> until door opened. And I thought, this must be it. <laughs> knock, 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 knock. Nothing. Knock, knock, knock. The door opens three inches with a chain. 
And I said, do sell herbs. <laughs> and I could see in the room behind the big room, there was boxes, em- boxes everywhere. And I was actually looking for some opium tea, which is very good for, for pain. So the man said, you didn't sell herbs at all. Oh, so I go back to the acupuncturist. And he said, I got the wrong unit C, so I go back again. I found another unit C. All the way up, there are sacks that big. You know, in life, if you don't look at the labels, you don't actually know what's inside. And remember, the labels may not say what's inside them anyway, may they? So I walk up and says, herbs from Brazil, herbs from Bolivia, right. herbs from Africa. And when I get up to the top, I couldn't believe it. There's a room half as big as this. And all the way down the wall were masculine cactuses. <laughs> the whole lot was, was alternative drugs. I just to tell you, it, it, it was the funniest thing. What, can you imagine this, you know? And they had no opium tea. Persistence, perseverance is very important. Okay, some of you may have heard this story, but it was, it was told the other day by somebody. A monk decides to retreat in solitude in the mountains of Tibet. After three years, he decides he's getting nowhere in his search for enlightenment. I mean, it might have been Konya, it might have been anywhere, mightn't it? How many of you have reached that point? Oh, got nowhere, right? Uh, um, anyway, he, he was in this cave in, in Tibet, or wherever he was. As he comes out of the cave, he notices a small bird flying back and forth to a crack in the rock with food for her young. He sees that her wings have worn the rock away near the crack just from continued hovering there. He is impressed and humbled by such an example of persistence and decides to carry on his solitary practice. After a further three years, he comes out again feeling he's getting nowhere. He sees a drop of water dripping onto stone, and which has worn a hollow in the rock over time. He is again impressed by this example of persistence and continues his practice. Three years later, he is getting nowhere and starts to descend. He leaves the cave. He meets a man with a large iron bar which he is rubbing against a boulder. He asks what he is doing. The man says he is rubbing it to make a needle. Again he returns to the cave. After twelve years in all, he finally leaves sadly, for he has not, quote, seen the Buddha. He is not. As he reaches the nearest town, he sees a mangy dog lying beside the road, covered with maggots. He is full of compassion. He decides the only way he can rescue the dog without harming the maggots is to cut a piece of flesh from his own leg and remove the maggots from the dog with his tongue. As he leans forward to lick the first maggot from the dog, he sees the Buddha. It's interesting, but traditionally, the Fanafi Sheikh, Fanafi Rasul, Fanafi Allah takes 12 years. Including their time in the cave and so on. And some people go through all that and the end is they don't still see the Buddha or whatever words you want. So to free the teacher, the word, it's called the Buddha of compassion, you have to have compassion. And that is the overwhelming love of God for, if you want that word, for all mankind. All sentient beings, you have to. The overwhelming love. Reason. And for that, you must already know the sound of forgiveness. Mm. Because without that, you can't have the compassion. So it is all possible. How long does it take? As long as a piece of string. I am merely saying to you, in my function as a teacher, that the awakening, of which there are, of course, many levels, but the awakening comes through the this incredible compassion and love for all of mankind. And having, be, having able, through the gift of God, to reach that point of complete forgiveness. There are no excuses for any of you 
not to have reached the point of complete forgiveness, no, including forgiving yourselves. This is important, and it's a beautiful idea. And lastly, I'll tell you the same story as this, only true, oh, this is a Buddhist story. When 1969, I started the first center in England called Bashara. We bought it even before I met Brilliant, in fact. And you will remember the story in my book, Here to Heal, how I had this vision, and so on. About 2,000, 2,500 people came through the doors in four years, I should think. And it was a passing, it was a stopping off point on the way to Istanbul or India or, you know, and some people stayed. And uh, although drugs weren't allowed, I did discover my best friend growing marijuana in the hedgerows, which was enough. <laughs> <laughs> he was very clever. But anyway, it was, a, it was a time of great movement and flow and the Beatles afterwards and real. And one young English girl came to see me. Calm. I'll never forget this. A drug dealer, heavy duty heroin, and she was about 19, I think. An appalling background for which every therapist would have a lovely time. And uh, you could easily blame the parents, the situation, whatever you want. But she wasn't having that. No, no, no. And for the first time in her life at Bashara, she, she tasted knowing she was loved. I don't know how I suggested it, but for some reason I suggested that at that time she go and see Trungpa Rinpoche, who was a great friend of mine as a Tibetan um, Rinpoche in Scotland. Because I felt the, the contamination of so much drugs and all the rest of it, I, I hadn't got the right place for her anyway. So she went there, and then I didn't hear any more because she went into a, um, a cave for three and a half years. Was one she? thousand and one days. The same length of time as your 1,001 day practice. But she came out, but she wasn't enlightened. But at least she was honest. And some people need more time than others. And so she went via um, Trumpa and others to India. And she met one of the Tibetan lamas, and they put her in a cave for 12 years. She's English. And she remained, and after she came out, I suppose you could say yes. And I just saw her recently on the television talking from the United Nations. And um, I remember that young girl in 1969. And now she runs a school for, lives in India, and runs a school for disabled children. And you could just see this extraordinary absolute, total state of conviction without any form of rigidity. So I can only say, may it be for you all as well. Without having to go into the tape for 12 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>